the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Well, it's great to be with you this morning, and I am certainly honored, and uh, on behalf of Beth uh, and myself, let me just say thank you to all of you here at First Baptist Indian Trail. Uh, this is our church home and uh, now, and we are certainly thankful and, and honored to be here. I told Preacher Mike uh, when, I, when we made the decision, and this was a church that has certainly ministered to us in so many ways, that this would be our church home. I said, you know, if the Lord opens up the door for me to preach, I said, I'm going to be probably the worst church member you've ever had. And um, he said, well, as long as you send your tithe each and every week. And <laughs> Uh, that's Preacher Mike, isn't it? And I said, well, that's not a problem. And, uh, but anyway, I am so honored. I'm currently serving as an interim pastor. Sure enough, God opened the door for me to preach at Stedman Baptist Church, a little community just outside of Fayetteville. So every Saturday afternoon, I leave Charlotte and drive down to Fayetteville, spend the night in Fayetteville, get up and preach their 8.30 service and their 11 o'clock service and travel back to Charlotte on Sunday afternoon. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to minister to to the great folks there at Stedman and preach God's word. But I must tell you, I miss this choir and I miss this church family. And, uh, and we are, Beth and I again, are so thankful for the way you have ministered to us, cared for us during uh, really one of the most trying times in our lives that we have ever walked through. And God continues to teach us, continues to show us things. In fact, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. But I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Joshua chapter 3. Because I want to share with you this morning out of this passage the way God has used this passage in my life to remind me again and again that the journey that we're on, there come some major moments of decision that all of us have to make. You know, the children of Israel, by the time you get to Joshua chapter 3, have already been on a long journey. Moses had led them all the way from Egypt. They had already crossed the Red Sea. They had made it into Kadesh Barnea. They had made it through the wilderness for all of those years. And they find themselves here on the third chapter of Joshua, camping on the banks of the Jordan River. And if you're a student of the Bible, you know that when you read the book of Deuteronomy, what you find there are the sermons that are actually recorded which Moses preached to the people before he died. And as Moses preached those sermons, there was a very astute young man that was listening to all of those sermons by the name of Joshua. And he had listened with great intensity. And what we find here is chapter 3, the, of God's people are on the eve of crossing over the Jordan River into the promised land. And it really was somewhat of one of the scariest times in their lives. And yet, it was crossover time. Yet, it was now decision time. And they had to make a decision once and for all. Are we going to go forward? Are we going to keep moving or are we going to become content in being bogged down with the past? That was their decision they had to make. And I dare say that there are crossover times that you faced in your life. Amen? You've gone through some seasons in your life and you've gone through some experiences in your life that you had to make that same type of choice. Are we going to keep moving forward or are we going to be paralyzed by the circumstances we find ourselves facing. And I think as children of God, we have to be aware that that's exactly where the children of Israel were when we find this. Some of you are facing crossover moments that you never imagined. Some of you just went through the death of a loved one that you never saw coming. Some of you have found yourself uh, dealing with a divorce that you would have never imagined could have happened to you. Some of you have gotten a diagnosis of a disease or something that has come to you recently and you can't quite understand why you're going through this. And some of you are dealing with pure discouragement because of circumstances in your life. But whatever it may be, 
Just go ahead and mark it down. At some point, you're going to have to make a decision. And that will be a decision, I pray, to leave your comfort zone and to step out on faith and go across that Jordan that's staring you in the face this morning. So I want you to stand and honor the reading of the Word of God. I want us just to read the first seven verses of chapter 3 to get started, and we're going to have to move quickly this morning. But notice it says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days, you might want to mark that down, after three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before." And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Father in heaven, I just pray in these next moments you would speak to us. Open our eyes that we might see. Open our ears that we might hear. But most importantly, open our hearts that we might receive what you have for us this day. And I just pray personally that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite you to jot down and notice with me this morning that when you come to that moment facing your Jordan, when you come to that moment of wanting to be a crossover man or a crossover woman, there's four things you cannot live without. Number one we see right here in Joshua 3 is you can't live without God's provision. You cannot do it without God's provision. You see, it's very clear in these opening verses of chapter 3 that this is a, there is a plan that God has provided. And they had to hold on to God's provision even though they were headed into a place, notice he said it, that they had never passed through before. When you come to those crossover moments, that's part of what makes them so scary. You're working and operating, perhaps in an arena that you've never operated in before. And you're being told to do something extraordinary. Going to a place you've never been before and depend upon God's provision every step of the way. Did you notice that it said there, I told you to take note of it, that they pondered it for three days. Three days passed that they were there on the banks of the Jordan. For three days they contemplated. Thousands and thousands of people had to be thinking and they had to be knowing that once they stepped into and crossed over that river, things would change from anything they had ever known. They had to be thinking about that. In fact, can I just tell you something? That's a great reminder to all of us of how we can get comfortable in our own personal wilderness. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, for 40 years, they've been wandering around in the wilderness. And if you're not careful, you can get so used to the wilderness. You can become so desensitized to the wilderness you're living in that, that you, you don't even realize it's a wilderness anymore. See, don't be afraid of change, ladies and gentlemen. I realize change is hard. But as we see here, being open to change, trusting God's provision and God's plan is an absolute necessity. 
In fact, if there's one thing that you could say about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's that he brought about a significant amount of change. Amen? I mean, few people were more of a serious change agent than the Lord Jesus. In fact, he actually, it was the changes that he was bringing that got him in so much trouble with the religious traditionalist of his day. So keep in mind, that evening, they're standing on the banks of the Jordan River. They had never passed this way before, but they had to realize God's got a plan here. God's making a provision that I may not be able to see. I may not be able to understand, but I'm trusting and holding on to it because you cannot do it without God's provision. But there's a second thing I want you to notice that happens here, and it's really cool because it, we see here in verse 3 that they couldn't do without God's presence. God's presence changed everything. Look at verse 3, what it says. He commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Now notice right there in verse 3, the people of God were to keep their eyes on something, right? What was it? The ark. And they were to follow with their eyes on the ark through the Jordan into the new beginning. Now, most of you will recall that that ark has fascinated men and women all over the world for some 3,000 years now. Even today, there are teams of explorers and people that are looking for it in various parts of the ancient world. But you and I know what that ark was all about. You remember it? It was an oblong wooden box. It was overlaid with pure solid gold. It had two golden cherubims on top where the wings would touch each other right over the mercy seat. If you took the lid off that box, inside that box were tablets of the law, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that was budded. That ark, you'll recall, had been placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle when they were worshiping in the wilderness. Later, that same ark was carried into the temple at Jerusalem. And it was there that, that God would visit his people on the high and the holy day of atonement. And, and frankly, with his Shekinah glory, his presence meant everything. We know, of course, on this side of the cross, that the ark was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And on that crossover day, that ark became the sign that not only had God provided a plan and had made a provision, but His presence would actually be with them and lead them across that river. Their job, their responsibility was as simple as could be. They only had two things they had to remember. I think even I could remember two things that I was told to do. What were the two things that was their responsibility? Keep your eyes on the ark. Number one, don't let them shift. Keep your eyes on the ark. And number two, go after it. Go after it. Those are the only instructions they were given. And up until this point, the Bible says, always speaks of how the ark was in the midst of the people. But now, you and I are seeing the ark is actually leading them into a new day. And, and did you notice that there had to be a certain amount of space between the ark and the people? You say, yeah, Mark, I noticed that it said ten or, or, or thousands of cubits space. That's exactly right. You know how much space was to be between the ark and where the people were? It was the equivalent of 10 football fields. They had to stand 10 football fields away from the ark. You say, why in the world was that? Because they had to be far enough away so everybody could see the ark. If they got crammed up too close, people would be dodging trying to see it. But if they were all far enough back, everybody could see the ark. It was that critical that every eye had to be on it. 
See, up until this point, the children of Israel had been following a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But now, those were gone. And the ark was in the place of leadership. And it was to lead them forward. And that's what you and I have got to understand. Think about the picture of the Lord Jesus going before us in the rivers that we have to face in this life. In the river that you're facing this morning, He stands in the midst of the river until you cross over. Listen, you can't come to a crossover moment and make it without God's provision. It's got to be His plan. You can't come to this river and get across it without God's presence. But I'll tell you the third thing real quickly and jot it down. You can't do it without God's promise. God's promise is found right there in verse 5. Look what it says. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now underline that word sanctify if it's not already underlined in your scripture. And in the margin you might write to set apart because that's literally what it means. In the Bible the whole idea of sanctification is both positional and progressive. The moment that you received Jesus Christ, you were saved and God set you apart for himself. That's positionally. But then if you truly know him, as your Savior, and you truly know Him personally, you grow and are sanctified by every day being more and more conformed to His image. Therefore, when you come to the end of your life and go to heaven, you should be more like Jesus on that last day of your life than you were the day you accepted Him as your Savior. Amen? You get that? We, we should all be growing. He should be chipping off a little of the old self every day to make us more like himself. And, and so that's what we find here. And Joshua comes around to the camp, and here's what he says, sanctify yourselves. What was Joshua saying? What, what did Joshua mean when he said, sanctify yourselves? I'll tell you what he meant. He meant it's time to commit yourselves. It's time for you to make a commitment to stay pure in your mind, to stay pure in your motives, to stay pure in your morals. Sanctify yourselves. It's commitment time. So what do you think happened? What took place on that very night before all of their dreams were going to be realized the next day. I'll tell you what happened. The people were getting right with God. That's what was happening. They were getting right with God. And then what happened? What always happens. You ready for this? What always happens when you get right with God? You start getting right with each other. Amen? See, don't, don't come up here and tell me today that, that you've gotten right with God and you've got bitterness and hatred toward another person because something doesn't add up. When they got right with God, they started getting right with one another. They started caring for one another. They started forgiving one another. They started bearing one another's burdens. They started loving one another. And I'll tell you what happened. When they started, when they started showing mercy to each other, when they started forgiving each other, and love began to flow with all of that going on, here's what happened. Oh, this is good. They started believing in tomorrow. That's what happens. You start believing in tomorrow. Remember Joshua said at the end of verse 5, tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Please hear me today, church. After years of no purpose, years of no direction, suddenly in the lives of these people there was hope. Why? Because they ceased living in the past and they began to believe in tomorrow, holding on to the promise of God. 
Can I tell you what one of the most dangerous times in your life is? Please, please don't miss this. One of the most dangerous times in your life is when your memories of yesterday are more prevalent and more important than your vision and hopes for tomorrow. You've just crossed into dangerous territory. I'm talking to somebody here this morning who you're allowing your memories of yesterday to be more prevalent and more important to you than your hopes and visions of tomorrow. And I got news for you. If anybody had good reason to hang out and dwell on yesterday, it was these people. Let's get real. They had witnessed with their eyes the parting of the Red Sea. They had seen and heard about manna falling from heaven to meet their needs every day. They had seen a pillar of fire by night. They had seen a cloud giving direction each day. They saw bitter waters turn sweet right before their eyes. They saw water flowing out of a rock. But now, as they are sitting on the banks of the Jordan River, how easy it would have been just to reminisce and think about how it could have been or had been. But crossover people don't do that. They believe in tomorrow. They believe in tomorrow. See, God didn't bring you to this river today. He didn't bring you to that place in your life just to sit there. He's offering you a new opportunity. But you've got to have his provision. It's got to be his plan, not yours. You've got to have his presence. You've got to have his promise. One last thing, jot this down. You'll only do it with his protection. You say, what do you mean his protection? Look at verse 6 and 7. It says in verse 6, Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and they went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. What's happening? Here's what's happening. The Israelites had leadership they could trust and they were willing to follow Joshua. Why? Because he was God's man. Because he was a fearless leader. Because he led with vision, not needs. You say, what do you mean not needs? I mean, they had lots of needs, but Joshua never allowed them to get caught up in the needs and let those become their focus. You see, Joshua led by example, and his leadership was so real and so contagious that the people followed him. And You'll notice in verse 12 and 13, if you drop down, they make it clear that the river was parted and it was the leaders who were the first ones to put their feet in the water and praise God, the fearless leadership won the day. Look, look at verse 12. It says, Now therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. And if you look over at verse 16, it basically tells you that's exactly what happened. The waters came down from upstream, stood still, and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that was beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And underline this, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. They became crossover people that day. They made it that day because they held on to God's plan, His provision, because they knew they couldn't do it without God's presence. 
because they understood that God had given them a promise and they would cling to it and they couldn't do it without God's protection. You, you see, the challenge that God continually places in my heart every time this passage jumps out at me is the problem that some of us have is we come right to the water's edge. We come right up to this river that's in front of us and we say, okay, Lord, here I am. Just cut off the waters right now. Let me see your miracle right now. Heap up those waters right now and then I'll cross over. That's not how it works. You saw the verses. The water didn't go anywhere until they first of all were willing to put the soles of their feet into that water. It was only when the soles of their feet hit the water that God performed the miracle. It was only when they trusted Him by faith that it actually took place. See, the problem in the modern church for so many of us I'm, I'm afraid I'm seeing is that we make the mistake of thinking we have to have it all calculated out with all of our human ingenuity. Amen? We want to dig our own trenches. We want to operate with our own initiatives, our own plans, our, our own promotion. In fact, the problem in the modern church is oftentimes we don't want to do anything unless it can be all laid out and explained by man. I got news for you. Our God is interested in doing things in his church again that can't be explained by man but could only be explained by the hand of Almighty God that has moved. That's what he's interested in. In doing things that only he can explain. Not that you and I can explain away. That's our God. And it's in him that we have to trust. For us, we have to be willing to get our feet wet with something called faith. We have to be willing to trust him. And then we see all of his provisions his presence, his promise, and his protection. As Beth and I have walked through these last months, God has, has done a work in our lives. Certainly not a work that I ever signed up for or ever would have imagined. It's been one of the darkest times in our lives. But it's interesting, in the midst of it, my youngest son, who's a youth pastor down in Gaston County, actually gave me a book by a guy named Mark Vrogop. I think is how you pronounce it. It's called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. And it's actually a study of the book of Lamentations. And i got to be honest with you, I've been preaching for more than 30 years. I've never done a series on the book of Lamentations. Never gone through the book of Lamentations like I've had to go through the book of Lamentations in the last several months. In the midst of that, Lamentations, turn, turn in Lamentations as I close over to the third uh, chapter, if you will. In Lamentations chapter 3, we're not going to take time to read it. I'm just going to encourage you to find it, and I want you to read it this afternoon or sometime this week. I encourage you because it does strike me interesting um, where we get some of our songs from because you look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. You could read on verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Anyway, in this book, this pastor, Mark Vergop, and his wife have gone through a tragedy in their own lives. And there in the third chapter of Lamentations, as he walks through that, I actually took notes. And it was interesting because in the midst of all of these storms, I, I could understand the political piece 
of we dealing with the state board of elections and all of the political appointments and that process, what I couldn't wrap my head around was the illness that befell me beginning on January 12th. That would ultimately from January 12th to five weeks ago, going through an illness that just about an infection that I became sepsis. I suffered two strokes in the midst of the hospital. I had on March 25th, eight to 12 inches of my colon removed due to the diverticulitis, which was the source of the infection. And then five weeks ago tomorrow, had a hole in my heart repaired that they found in the midst of all of that. And that's what actually kept me from running in this new election. Otherwise, I would have been there and it would have been a rematch from what we had went through last November. But I couldn't because of all the physical sickness that I was dealing with at that time. And that's the part I've had my heart, my hard time wrapping my head around is, Lord, what are you doing? I, I know what man means for evil, God means for good. I get that. I've read the story of Joseph. I've gone to him many times in the midst of this. But, but there were four things that I found in this book, deep clouds, dark clouds, deep mercy, that I wrote down. And I wrote them on this little pad I was given during my orientation week at the U.S. House of Representatives. I keep it in my pocket so that each day I can pull this out and remember these four things that Lamentations 3 taught. Number one, God's mercy never ends. God's mercy never ends. Number two, waiting is not waste. Waiting on God to move is never a waste of time. Number three, I love this one. The final word has not been spoken. The final word, at some point in the future, the final word will be spoken and God will intervene in his way, in his time. And then number four, God is always good. He is always good all the time. Whatever your river is that you've come to today, you got a choice. You can be paralyzed by fear or you can look to Him and trust He's got a plan. He's made provision for this. His presence is there. He's going to guide you through it. He's given you a promise. He's got this. He's got this. And he's going to protect you all the way through to fulfill the plans and purposes he has for us. Would you bow your heads right where you are, please? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over the sanctuary. You know, I don't know what the Lord may be laying on your heart this morning, but I do know this. God does have a plan. He's got a plan for my life. He's got a plan for yours. He's got moments in time that we find ourselves walking across. Moments that He brings us to the edge of the river and He wants to teach us so much about Him to grow us deeper and walk closer than we've ever been to Him before. Would you just listen to the still small voice of His Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I just got to tell you, you don't know what crossover moments are because you're freezing every time. You can't go forward because you don't have Him to rest your eyes upon. He wants to lead you, but you have to be willing to let him take the lead if you want to come today and give your life to Christ our counselors right here at the front I'm going to be down here at the front you're welcome to do that if God's leading you to join this church I got to tell you it's one of the greatest churches in America by far I've had the privilege of worshiping here if God's leading you take that step and cross that river today 
Or maybe he's just leading you to get on this altar because I can promise you this. You may have not come to a river or a crossover moment last week, but that only means there's a really good chance that there's one coming next week or the week after that. Or maybe you're right in the midst of it now and you just want to get alone with God on this altar. Father in heaven, guide this invitation. Let us be obedient and let us be found faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet right where we are? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.